Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today we have as our guest um, an amazing team, a um, university team that won the third place in the North America region in OpenCV AI Competition 2021. And they also participated in the OpenCV AI Competition 2020. So it also shows, you know, perseverance and a lot of teams, a lot of people getting together to make uh, an amazing um, submission in the in the competition. Uh, great team. I also love that not only is it a university team, it's a collaborative team across multiple continents. Uh, so I will let all the members introduce themselves. Uh, we can start with uh, Paula. Thank you, Zadia, for having us here. It's an honor to participate in your, web, your uh, weekly webinar. So my name is Paula Ramos. I computer vision and machine learning scientist, former research from NCSU. North Carolina State University. I was uh, the leader of the competition, so with OpenCV, and it's a pleasure to show you the results today. Thank you. Nice. Uh, uh, Maria, would you like to go next? Sure. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So my name is Maria Laura, and uh, I work at NC State, even I'm stationed in Maryland. Um, so I do a lot of project management for our team and also and I'm part of the tech uh, technology transfer team where we try to make uh, technology more understandable for the end user. Um, and then in this competition I participated as uh, the end user, as the data collect collector, as uh, the experiment setup person. So we'll be showing you some of that uh, in the slides. That's great. Uh, Soren? Yes, my name is Søren Skorsen. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Aarhus University in Denmark. Uh, my background is, is engineering and, and computer scientist. So I've been working on the data science part of this project. So basically uh, data synthesis and computer vision models. Great, thanks. Uh, Matt? Yeah, hi, my name's Matt. I'm a second year PhD student at Texas A&M University in College Station, studying under Dr. Mutu Um, my research interests have to do with applied computer vision in agriculture. Uh, for this project, I worked on the uh, data annotation pipeline and uh, synthetic data generation. That's great. So the team consists of uh, research researchers from, you know, NCSU, from uh, Denmark and uh, Texas. That's great. And as always, we have our content uh, manager, uh, Phil, who, uh, you know, who puts together these webinars and helps uh, OpenCV in several other ways. Hello, Phil. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And thanks to Team Benchbotics for being on the show this week. As always, we will be doing Q&A during the webinar. Please use the Zoom Q&A functionality to ask your question at any time during the show, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. We will also be giving away uh, a special item uh, for our trivia contest today. So play, pay attention to the slides because uh, you might be able to win something. The, the special item, obviously, you know, we are running a Kickstarter campaign for OpenCV AI kit with depth, light, oak delight, and uh, you might have seen the Kickstarter campaign. If not, um, Phil will share it here. Uh, it's doing very well, but we still need your support because we have we are not spending any money on adverti advertisements, uh, and we just hope that the community spreads the word. It's an amazing device, 4K uh, camera uh, with a neural compute stick, not, not a neural compute, with a neural compute engine inside it. So it can do four uh, trillion operations per second. It also has a depth um, uh, it also has a stereo pair for depth estimation. Uh, so Phil will share the link to our Kickstarter campaign for people who do not know about it, but I'm guessing that most people on this webinar probably have ordered a, ordered one or two. Yep. Just <laughs> drop the link in the chat there for everybody and we'll have it in the show notes too. All right, that's, that's great. So let's get started, Paula. Can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Looks so great. First of all, Satya and Phil, thank you for having us here. That is an honor to participate. So and it was an honor also to participate in the competitions 2020 and 2021. A lot of lessons, results, and future. So 
we got the, 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 the third place in the regional award for North American region. So, and, and, and I'm so proud of this team. So, you know, right now, Matthew, sorry, Maria Laura and I, but we were 10 in this team. So, and we were talk, talking um, on behalf of them today. So Chris and Steven are the co-leaders of the project, Preciso Sustainable Agricultural Project, PSA. Edgar Lobaton is an associate professor from the Electrical and Computer Engineer Department of the NCSU. Also, Artem and Majores, uh, they were working with us as graduate students, working in different hardware and software projects. And Jack is a research technician in, in USDA, in with Maryland, helping Maria Laura with the data collection process. So we could start. So this is the, the little outline that we have for today. Can, can, can I interrupt you, Paula, just a little bit? Because uh, I was, I was, I know you, you did not mention it, but you were recently featured on Forbes uh, for, you know, uh, in the magazine, uh, as I saw one of the articles that featured you. So congratulations on that. And you were too humble not to mention that at all. <laughs> I just oh wanted God, to bring it up. Oh my God, that's embarrassing, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Satya. Thank you so much for doing that. So, uh, so Phil can share the link. Uh, I'll drop the link in the chat to embarrass you further with your success, Paula. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil. <laughs> and also, uh, they are talking also about the bench spot. So, but we have also another kind of technologies working in all my 16, 16 years of experience. So thank you, Phil and Satya. So, so, okay, this is a, a, a small outline that we have for today. We will make like a, very, a little introduce about the weeks. So, and, and also we will talk about how the PSA project is working with machine learning, local sensors for with detection specifically, and the experience that we have with our participation in all open CV competition, the result that we have, we have for 2020, 2020 and 2021. So let's start. So the first thing that we need to mention is um, what is the meaning of wheat? So maybe a lot of people could think, ah, oh, cannabis, it's the fair, oh, I have some weeds in my garden. But I mean, to be honest, the weeds that we are talking here is a different thing. So, but we can define weeds as any plant growing where it is not wanted. This is the main thing. So on the saleable plants, on the crops. And normally they tend to, grow, to overgrow, maybe bigger than the canopy of the crop. Unfortunately, the, those plants uh, compete for nutrients, water, solar radiation, and space, and space with the crops. And in that case, if uh, the farmers don't control the weeds, they, they, there is a potential loss in yield of 50%. Imagine the farmer could, could lose the 50% of production if they don't control the weeds. To control the weeds, we can see different methods. So we can see mechanical, just remove the weeds from the ground, <clears throat> chemical, biological, and cultural. <clears throat> Unfortunately, so we can see how the, 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 the weeds uh, feel resistant to numerous herbicides. And that is a big deal because uh, the, the weed is resistant. So the, the, the meaning of that is that that weed, weed will be there for a long time, just making this, this competi com competition with the crop. Every five years, new weeds appear also. And the industry could create for sure um, new chemicals. But this during the time is unsustainable. So that is a, a, a big point. So, and we can say that right now we are in this attack of the super weeds. So, and the herbicides are losing the one. Um, so it's also very difficult. Um, I, I'll assu uh, I'm assuming that, you know, because uh, ultimately weeds are, it's a human definition, right? It is things that we do not want. They are all called weeds. So creating some like a herbicide, which doesn't affect the main crop and only targets the weed, it's, uh, it's not easy, right? Because ultimately, uh, like Matt was mentioning before this meeting, that uh, even uh, like corn can be considered a wheat when it affects other crops. You know, it just grows sometimes and it's a weed, right? That is correct. 
And also there is a very good point, Satya, because we need to understand better the phenotyping of the plants. That is one of the things that we are doing uh, with our projects. So we try to understand better the morphology, the architecture of the plants, the size and the, the, grow, the, the grow stage and how we can control these kind of plants. And this, I mean, you, you talk about the herbicides, but we have a lot of technology around weeds. And the first thing is that we need to understand the plant. We need to produce and, 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 and use a better technology to understand the plants. Yeah. So, and another big challenge that we have is that we need to find a way to fit the world. We need to find the way to, to fit the world 10 billion people by 2050. That is a lot. And one of the things that we need to do is improve the agricultural practices because we will have, right now we have water scarcity, herbicide resistant, as I told you. The climate, the climate change is a reality. There is no a dream, it's a reality. So, and also we have a poor quality of soil and water that could decrease the production of the crops. So, and in that case, we need to understand better that relation between environment, genetics, and yield. And that is also related with the thing that I told you before. So, and this is a complex scenario, but if we, if we think about that, we can talk about the technology, for instance, computer vision technology, for better understand, understanding of these relations in between genetics, environment, and yield, we can define a complex problem. You know, a lot of structures, uh, vegetative structures, we can see occlusion, we can see um, uh, shadows, uh, occlusion. So we have a lot of problems that we don't want in the computer vision community. So we just want to avoid these kind of things. And also, if we think about this, the problem is complex, but also the players are complex. So imagine that we have a computer science engineer without knowledge of agricultural problems. In another side, we have right. the agronomist without familiarity or experience uh, in advanced technologies as deep learning or for machine learning. So but at some point, we need to find a way to, to put all together in the same, on the same page and work it's together. Also, it's also, I mean, for people uh, who are early in their careers, these kinds of intersections are also great uh, career opportunities. Uh, early in my career, uh, just a little story, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, I actually used an object detector that was used uh, very commonly. Uh, it was called the Viola and Jones object detector or the Har Cascades. Um, I coded it from scratch because at that time there was no implementation. Um, and I applied it to cryo-electron microscopy uh, projects, right? So. Uh, Basically, something that was in computer vision, I directly took that and put it into cryo-electron microscopy. And I was actually very, very hesitant. My advisor said, no, this is fine. You know, you're giving credit to people who invented it, but you're applying it to a different domain. So this is a paper. I was not even sure whether there, it should be a paper, but they were so happy, the uh, cryo-electron microscopy people, that my work was featured as the cover of Journal of Structural Biology uh, and this was, I, I'm not even pretending, right? This was a straight out implementation of VLI and Jones uh, algorithm applied to a different field. So, uh, and they were, you know, I, I was so hesitant. I kept telling them that, look, this is somebody else's algorithm. I just applied it. And they said, no, this is fantastic because you are just narrowly focused on your contribution. Nobody cares about your contribution. <laughs> what you have done is you have enabled uh, other people to know about this technology, right? So you have crossed the domains, right? And you're just narrowly focused that, oh, your contribution is uh, so small in this. Uh, but think about the community. The community benefited by having this knowledge, right? Uh, so a... yeah, uh, my point was that uh, when, if you can find a domain where you're working at the intersection of two different domains, you somehow happen to know uh, computer vision as well as agriculture, or you're able to collaborate with those people, those are great, those are where great careers uh, would be made. That is a good point, Satya. And also this is the thing that we are trying to do with this project. So because we have uh, a big team, so PSA uh, is a big team, we have a network of uh, government agency that is the USDA, universities, 
We have a, a lot of industries around uh, working with hardware and software approaches. And also we have the farmers. So, and when you have the view of the end user, it's great because you can, you can understand better the, the needs that the end user has. And also a little bit more about the background of the problem in the agricultural way, but also around the, the solution itself that is the computer vision part. And so we are trying to cover in the, you know, the, the complete framework. And we have this idea about the preci uh, precision framework that we need to work. We were talking about sustainable agriculture, but we need to make this sustainable agriculture. We need to create precision on that sustainable agriculture. That is the point. So we have a, net, a network of farmers. So we have on, our own farm network. We have also the connection in between tools and data and also real time decision support tools for be used by people, any user, non-tech people. And this is one of the main things also. Right. So in, with this framework, we are looking to increase the yield of the, of the crops, decrease the use of the water, and also make with suppression on the crops. So this, this is one, one of the things that also we want, we want to do. How we can do that? And that depends also the, the, the specific problem that we were talking about, that we are talking about. But in this case, we are talking about wheat. So uh, for that, we, the next point is to talk about the machine learning and local sensors for wheat detection. So, and this is a great point because Precision Sustainable Agricultural Project is working on that right now. It's, it's, it's spending a lot of time making these improvements and, implement, and, and implementations. And so, here, I just want to show you uh, uh, our pipeline in computer vision that also has a, a, a main role. So when you talk about computer vision system to quantify weeds in the field, we need to think about the, um, it's a complex problem, as I told you. So we need to think about the outdoor conditions on disable movement of the camera, uh, occlusion shadows. But also if we think about the end user, we need to define the specifications there. Low cost, just to close the gap in between the user and the technology, to increase the adoption of the technology. Easy to use, because we are talking about non-tech people, mainly. Easy to maintain is because we want that they use the technology this season, but also maybe in the next seasons. So easy to maintain is, and user-friendly. So in this way, when we talk about with quantification or with detection, we have two lines. Identification is one and phenotyping is another one. For the, for the identification, we can see there um, the machine learning and deep learning approach. So we can see object detection system or semantic segmentation just to identify the species of the weeds of the categories. When, uh, when we, we, will, we will talk about categories in this webinar. When we talk about categories, we are doing like a hierarchical classification of the weeds. So we are not talking about specifically one species, but just the category that we have. So the phenotyping is also related with computer vision because we need to integrate different kind of image processing systems there just to process 2D and 3D images. So in this case, we, we want to do 3D reconstructions and also measure some metrics of the plant, the plant growth metrics, or also the population dynamic. That is important. So in this case, L go Lorraine, ahead. Could you just uh, explain a little bit uh, for people uh, who may not know, what is uh, phenotyping, that, that word, what does that mean? Yeah, what's a phenotype? Yeah. So I, 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 I want that Matthew uh, define phenotyping. Could you define phenotyping for me, please? Yeah, sure. So phenotyping is the observable characteristics in this case of a plant. And a phenotype is the interaction of the environment on a plant's genotype or its genetic structure, right? So when we say phenotyping, we're really saying we want to be able to study a plant and how the environment and its genetics interact, right? So, so this tells us a lot about growing conditions, changes of, of plant, changes of communities, um, uh, you know, resistance, herbicide resistance, phenotyping plays a major role in understanding, you know, how a plant's genetics affect its ability to resist uh, an herbicide and 
observing its outside characteristics, um, you know, is, is phenotyping. I'm, I'm glad I asked because I had a different, <laughs> I was thinking of slightly different, something slightly different. Does it also mean that when you observe, let's say, uh, by genetics alone, the plant would have certain size leaves, but let's say the soil conditions change, the leaves would be bigger, or is that uh, what it refers to also? Yeah, exactly, okay. right? So, so the soil being sort of environment, environmental conditions, genetics, uh, you know, has certain leaf size, but the, the environment is, is sort of influencing that. That's great. All right, thank you. That is the reason we, that is the reason we need the two players on yeah. the complex problem. So, and we are working right now in these two different branches. So for the identification itself, we are working right now in, in one of the projects that we have is the AMOS repository. So, and at, at some moment, Satya, we, we talk about, we, we tell you about that, and that we were working in the creative, the biggest image repository for the WITS in the US. Uh, in that case, we have also the context of the benchmark as a platform to uh, install in the semi-field condition of greenhouses. But also in the phenotyping way, we have some equipment ready to go that we were using uh, science last year and we started this year with the beta testing. Uh, and this is a, this is, this, this 3 really re reconstruction was done by the GoPro camera. So we also were working with a GoPro camera in an Android app and cloud computing to have this ready. This is a destruction for motion approach. And as the com computer vision community knows, this is a high demanding task. Right. So, and we were working, we were, work we were thinking maybe we can, make something different, we can improve a little bit the real-time process. And this is the reason why uh, we started to think about the OGD camera as a solution for the width detection. Yeah. So instead of the GoPro camera, we were thinking maybe we can use the OGD camera. And we, this, is, this is the one big picture of the OpenCV Special AI Competition 2020. So we made our, our own custom board with the modular camera, uh, we needed to guarantee uh, the minimum depth distance of 20 centimeters. And also we have like a portable system. So we have a Raspberry Pi, a power bank, and a monopole. And we made uh, also some design here in the case uh, just to avoid a lot of uh, uh, full, full radiation over the lenses. So if you are interested to read more about this project, just take a, a picture of this QR code, but this is this was a, a great a, a great moment for us. We le we did learn a lot with this, so um, it was not it was no simple. It was complex, you know. This is a complexity thing. So we are talking about other conditions, occlusion, shadows. We have all things one package of this of problems. So we have a very good approach. We we saw the potential of the technology. We made uh, the complete pilot that you could see today. We, we run exactly the same pipeline, but unfortunately in this case, we have some issues with the real time process because we were the booking the camera. We have some problems with the synchronization with the control of the, uh, the camera control system. We have an issue with the auto exposure uh, uh, configuration that the stereo module has or had. And also we were working close to Luxonics to fix this issue. Yeah. But okay, we saw the potential, that was great. And we saw that we can predict the biomass with this coefficient of determination, 0.8, 0 0.5. That is, that is good for the, first, for the first round with the camera. Right. So that's, that's very cool. So you were able to predict, because it's a depth camera, you're looking at, uh, at, at the crop from the top and so you know the depth, how the height, and from that you could uh, estimate the biomass. Is that? Yeah. yeah. So we were running here. The pipeline was we were using the RGB camera just to run the semantic segmentation model to identify yeah. the category of which. So we were working with two categories: grasses and broadleaves. Mm -hmm. And after that, we were able to match the depth and analyze the histogram of the depth over this specific area. Yeah. And we made something that is called the canopy high, the canopy high analysis. 
just to define the number of pixels that we have uh, and create like, a, create like a surface analysis over the histogram information coming right. from the depth. That was the general idea of the OpenCV competition 2020. And you can see the complete history in the link. So go ahead, please. So, so as, as, I, as I showed you, we have a complex and dense real world system. Uh, that is this one. And was, uh, we, we have a lot of lessons there, but maybe just to understand better the phenotyping, uh, the characteristics that we need to measure for widths, and also with a little more control of the camera and also the movement of the camera, we wanted to move the experiment to the greenhouse. So for that reason, we were thinking, okay, we can we could we could do that in the, into the greenhouse where we can reduce the pulsar radiation, control the other conditions, minimize, minimize the occlusion, but also work with the main problems that we have with the over the camera in the first round, 2020. So, and that was the, the thing that we were doing. So anyway, so the benchmark, as I told you, was there. So because the benchmark was we we create we we created the benchmark uh, also last year. But the, the benchmark was waiting for the OD camera. And it sounds like a romantic tales, but it's true. The benchmark <laughs> was waiting for the OD camera. So, and what is the benchmark? A, a because... match made in heaven, as they say. <laughs> oh, the perfect match, yes. The perfect match, OD camera plus benchmark. <laughs> so when we designed uh, the benchmark, so we were thinking something that we need to make low cost. And the, this is just thinking, uh, um, and the end user, the end user of, of that is the plant breeder. So in the benchmark is a plant phenotyping platform and mainly has two components, a semi-automatic image acquisition device that is on the top of the benchmark and also a central process unit to control the platform. It's possible to move the camera back and forward and the camera could take images. So we were testing the benchmark with different cameras. And we saw that the perfect match was with the OD camera. And this is not a joke, this is a reality. So, and, and this is the thing so what, that, that, that we have. Uh, we start with this idea to use the OD camera with the bench board just to reduce the, these conditions and, and work with the, with the hardware setup, improve a little bit the conditions, the problems that we have with the camera, with the camera control system and the synchronization. So we were using exactly the same custom board with the, F FC version of the uh, OD camera because we also we needed a minimum depth distance of 20 centimeters. That our baseline was 2.7 centimeters and we were using the Raspberry Pi as a host. Right. And I mean, we were working on that. So we were uh, as a hardware team, we were working uh, directly with Maria Laura. Uh, so she was testing the, the, the scripts that we were making here in North Carolina. So we were working also close to Luxonics to fix the issues that we have for data collection because we needed full size resolution of the images, RGB and depth. So we needed to synchronize the RGB, disparity map, depth, non PRI. But unfortunately, the, synchroniz the synchronization, um, we, we, could, we could not fix the synchronization part. So we needed to make some changes but the, this, this was not because of the camera, it was because of the host, because the Raspberry Pi didn't support that. Mm -hmm. So the point is that we needed to change the, the host, but okay, maybe we, we can make another change. So, and we were working with different kinds of synchronization. But you can see right now how the data collation was. So Thank just you. so uh, some people may not know uh, if they don't know, you know, Luxonis, uh, the, uh, the company that uh, Paula mentioned is uh, basically the hardware partner. They designed the hardware and also the APIs, et cetera, for OpenCV AI kit. So that's, um, that's the company. But I'm guessing that most people know on this webinar, uh, some may not. So right now, um, we could start with the data collection, Maria Laura. The word is yours. Sure, thank you, Paula. Uh, okay, so if we want to move to the next slide, I'll be uh, giving you a little bit of my perspective as a, an end user of the technology and what my experience was. Um, so first of all, I wanted to 
talk a little bit about the bench pot. I know Paula talked about it, um, but uh, is this um, structure that you are seeing here in this picture on the left? And it's pretty interesting and cool, I think, because it's modular. What does that mean? Is that that means that we can add parts to it and we can change the height, we can change the width. In that way, that makes the structure pretty versatile and we, uh, for people to be able to use it in different greenhouses with benches of different sizes. Um, and again, it's low cost, so that's great. So the system basically consists in three main parts and those are a driver, a host, and the camera. So by uh, combining, using the driver and the camera's API and using the Raspberry Pi as our host, uh, we were able uh, to integrate that and uh, semi-automate the process, which is great. Like a lot of these tasks uh, in phenotyping are very demanding in, time, in, in terms of labor and time. So if we can automate these tasks, that is definitely a great win uh, for the industry. Um, so, so Maria, uh, can you explain, suppose this bench bot, ex uh, uh, the bench bot was not there how would people do it manually? You know, I just want to hear out the process, how tedious the process is. Suppose we did not have the bench bot, what would be the process? Yeah, so actually um, this whole bench bot thing started two years ago because uh, we were, we had this breeding project. We were trying to develop a line of clovers that were resistant to shade. And that is because clovers grow, are used as a cover crop. And if we want to intercede them, they are going to grow under the shade of corn or of soybeans. So we were trying to figure out, develop a line that was resistant to shade. And for that, in order to, as Matthew was explaining, understand better the, the phenotype and which phenotypes were, were better suited for that, what we did is we measured uh, the height and the width by hand. And then you can imagine that when we had that time 960 plants to do this every week right that wasn't that was very time consuming labor intensive uh so yeah we then start thinking about okay what can we do then to do this more efficiently um and then paula joined the effort and the bench what is the end result of that <laughs> Yeah, yes, I, I learned from, uh, you know, when when working in cryo-electron microscopy, I, I learned that people in biology are much more patient uh, than computer science people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in there, you know, somebody would tell me that, oh, this thing is, uh, I was shocked at some manual work that was required to do uh, in the lab. And I said, oh, this thing is going to take a, uh, take a long time. And somebody says, no, it's, it can be just done within a week. <laughs> and it was like a week of manual work. Like, um, but yeah, uh, I, you know, that's why this interaction between computer science people and uh, other fields, it helps both, both of us, right? It makes the computer science people more patient, but at the same time, it adds automation to these, uh, these other fields. There's, yeah. there's the, uh, the three virtues of the virtuous programmer, laziness, impatience, and hubris. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I did not know about that. <laughs> yeah, but also we have to think, uh, this is great because, because of this task being so time demanding, they, are also, they can also limit how much we can do. So if we can develop technologies that speed up all these processes, then we can uh, scale. And that is amazing when we're talking about trying to figure out which are the best traits uh, in these plants. So uh, we definitely are moving towards that direction. And that's what we need to do. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, so uh, something that I wanted to bring up, because I think that that added uh, Another layer of color to this project, and I, I felt that it was a great uh, experience, is how our team was able to work in different, uh, considering that we were situated in different locations in the US, also at Soren from Denmark. Actually, at some point, I had to travel to Argentina. So from there, too, I was working from Argentina. So it was definitely amazing, I think, to experience that. Um, but yeah, the way that we would work, for example, the first weeks uh, uh, on the competition is that we were trying to troubleshoot all these issues. 
So uh, we had these Zoom meetings. Uh, I will just connect with the camera through uh, my, the Raspberry Pi, remote desktop to it, and then share what I was seeing with everyone uh, in the team. And I think that, that was an amazing experience because I was getting then input from everyone. Uh, we were fixing issues all together. And yeah, that was great. And definitely made part uh, of, of the, this competition. It made it even better. Um, so yeah, in terms of what my experience was as an end user, I think that the technology is, it was, the end product was easy to use. That doesn't mean that it was easy to get there <laughs> by no means. Uh, but then once we got there, I think that is just simply by me typing some command lines into uh, my computer, I was able to uh, make uh, the platform move, collect all the images that I needed in, in a short period of time. So I think that uh, as an end user, and I feel that a lot of people out there doing plant breeding will be happy to have something like this uh, to use. So we can move to how the next bench slide. are out there uh, right now? I mean, how, how many have you guys built? So we have one in Maryland, and now we have three in North Carolina. One that is built already, and two that we are building in the next two weeks for, uh, no, in the next week, sorry, <laughs> for a uh, hackathon. And then also one has been purchased for Texas. Um, the, so Matthew is gonna be getting one soon there. So we are gonna be, have this working all for, no, sorry, five soon. Yes. And the design and everything is open source in case some universities uh, want to uh, build their own. Right. Yes, we are actually working. So there is already a GitHub repo, but we are working on uh, making it fully available for everyone. So anyone that wants can put this setup together. And again, because it's modular and you can adjust according to your needs, depending on which your, uh, how your, um, Greenhouse is um, designed, you will be able to use it too. That's great. Yes, the, the, idea, the idea with the open source system is that we are looking for something that we can escalate simple. So we are looking to create the, just avoid the, uh, maybe some gaps in the market chain. So we have this open source system and you also could use the, the same pieces that we have because this is like a Lego. Uh, and just buy, buy the things by yourself. And Maya Laura, you have a very good history about how you made the first the first best food. So <laughs> during the pandemic, so it was was difficult. So and we didn't have access to the buildings and facilities, but we wanted to work. And Maya Laura had the need, uh, and and I have the design. So we worked together, and she was working in his, in her kitchen. So it was a great history working on that. Yeah, I bet the first bench foot was built on top of my kitchen bar. So I was scanning food instead of plants, but <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> uh, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about the experiment per se, like how we set up this experiment. So we had 60 plants per frame and we had six frames total. And why is that we had these six frames is because we wanted to track a little bit the development of the plant. So Plants don't look the same all the time. So we wanted to get it, have in our data set smaller plants and bigger plants. So we did this data collection, uh, this image data collection uh, in week one, two, three, uh, until six. Uh, so we got those different sizes and those some uh, changes in morphology for the, for the different individuals. We also had 10 different plant species, again, because we wanted to have these differences in our data set. And at the same time, this uh, plants were divided in three categories. Uh, these categories were clover, grass, and broadleaf. And the reason we included these 10 specific species and we divided in categories is because our species or categories are of interest for us. As I was telling you about the clover, because uh, we are part of this clover breeding network, so it's a plant of interest for us. And then within this grass and broadleaf, we included wheat species that are of interest for us as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And then moving more into the data collection process uh, per se, um, the, what we had to do at the beginning of each uh, data collection event was the calibration. And that is because we mounted the camera on a plastic case. And the thing in a greenhouse is that the weather, the um, temperature can be pretty extreme in summer days. 
So we didn't want to risk them having problems in our data because of the sensors move, uh, moving. So we did the calibration uh, before every data collection event, which it wasn't too time consuming and it's easy to do. Uh, so we did that at the beginning. And then after all that was all done, um, what we needed to do is make sure that the bench was aligned because at this point, the bench foot, the movement on top of the pot lines is uh, automated, but the movement from row to row or line to line, we have to do it by hand. And actually this is something I forgot to say, but that's something that we are also working on is that we wanna make this prototype fully, uh, uh, I don't, uh, fully automated. So that's something that we are working on now. And it's the next step in this project is uh, to reach that. So that's gonna be the happiest day of my life is when I see uh, this just being a, me being able to remote control it. So I'm just gonna be in my office with air conditioner and I'm gonna press the button and it's gonna do everything for me. <laughs> nice. So hopefully we get there soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, so once we have uh, the bench bot um, calibrated, we need to make sure that it is aligned. So for that, we had like an RGB preview that we could go and check, make sure that the pods were aligned. Uh, that the image was in focus and things like that. And then once we are ready uh, with all that, we just run this batch file, uh, which has all these commands necessary in order to move the plate that which the camera is mounted to and also to uh, acquire the images. So the way we program it is that uh, the camera was gonna move on top of the line of pods, but it was gonna stop 17 times and uh, each of these stops was going to be collecting 30 to 80 images. Uh, and then that was pretty much it. And then once it finished at the 17th spot, uh, we will need to move the bench to the next line and start the process again. So, um, sorry, I have something else to say in the previous one. <laughs> and then the last thing after that was uh, going to be uploading the data uh, to the cloud. So everyone had it available and we could keep working on the next steps. The way the data was organized is as you can see here on your right, we had a folder per week, per row, and then per stop. And each stop, as I said, you had all the RGB and the depth data. And then now, yes, we can move. Is this data also open source or are you going to make it open source at some point? It is open source and is available right now in the GitHub repository. Awesome. That's really good. And then the, this slide that is gonna be the last for me is just to in, in some way show how this all, our data collection call, um, connects with what comes next. That are the things that uh, Matthew and Soren are gonna be talking to you about. So we collected in two, group, two groups of data, let's say. So one was the data we acquired through an OD camera, that is what we were talking about until now, but then we also had to collect ground truth biomass. Um, so the OD data was uploaded to, uh, to the um, Azure um, blob storage, and then it became available. So Soren in Denmark or Matthew in Texas could work on their annotation, CNN training and biomass estimation models. But then we also, as I said, collected the ground truth biomass because that our end goal is to estimate biomass. And we need to know what the biomass is in order to be able to do that. So basically what we did is after each uh, image collection process uh, finished is we cut those plants, we put them in bags, we dry them in the oven for 48 hours. And then that is the way that we use in order to um, correlate um, for the models. So what you can see here in the center of uh, the slide is the map of which images we use to assignate that, that biomass value to. Uh, and then what you see next to it is a um, regression of the real biomass versus the estimated biomass. And that's all I have uh, for you today. And I think that Matthew is gonna be talking now, unless you have any other question uh, regarding data collection. Let's keep rolling. Great, yeah, let's, let's go. Uh, so as Maria was saying, we are moving this machine across the table uh, and over 12 rows. At each row, the sensor is stopping 17 times. Each time it stops, 
it takes anywhere from like 30 to 80 images, right? And so there, this is where our sort of organizing and cleaning process begins, right? We, we've got to sort of sort through these images. We did some, some pretty simple basic pre-processing, removing duplicates, uh, removing blurry images. The reason we took so many images per stop is to allow the machine to stabilize, adjust to light, um, autofocus, all these different types of things. So, uh, you know, we're collecting quite a bit. Um, we use some, some pretty simple tools, uh, lap variants of the Laplacian filter. So essentially, you know, at how fast or at what rate is an image changing across that image? I had a little, little bit of calculus involved, but it's essentially one line of code. At the end of our project, uh, at the end of our six week collection, I'm looking down here in the lower right graph, um, you can see sort of the distribution of our data across weeks. The Y axis is the number of images, a number of unique images we collected, right? And that's what we were after. Per week, we were after about 204 unique images. You can see in sort of the first couple, two or three weeks, um, you know, there was some troubleshooting, right? We were trying to figure things out. We had some issues with the sensor itself. We worked really closely with the Luxonics team to, to overcome that, made some updates. Um, there's also a couple of issues with like Wi-Fi connectivity, just pretty like normal stuff for, for you know, developing this type of technology. Uh, but after that third week, we really sort of hit our stride, started consistently collecting, uh, you know, all the images we, we wanted. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. And so once we had those images, we can start annotating. We can start, you know, really extracting that data because collecting the images is really just one half uh, of the story. We need those labels. And the point was to be able to develop a data set of cutouts of plants, right? So that could then be used to generate synthetic data sets. Um, to do that, we took one of those unique images, did uh, used a vegetation index. So vegetation index is uh, just a combination of image bands that emphasize vegetation or certain properties of vegetation. In this case, we use excess green, which is really, as it sort of says, it's emphasizing the green band in an image and de-emphasizing all the other bands, right? So if you have green plants, it's really going to pop out, as you see in this right image. Um, from there, we use some, depending on species, um, some unsupervised classification techniques, K means clustering, um, some morphological sort of selection operations. Um, so these things in the lower left corner, you know, we talk about these things as components. So these, you know, if the component was large, if it was small, uh, depending on its size, you apply certain rules, All right? This is all done in Python um, using OpenCV, NumPy, pretty simple uh, stuff. And then after we made these annotations, we sort of created these cutouts. And then I would manually go through these cutouts and remove sort of bad results. As you can see here, lower left corner of the slide, um, you know, leaves. Our, we wanted entire plants, right? The, the whole plant, the better. Um, and so, we, you know, going through those each week took me about 30 minutes, right? And so when you compare this technique with sort of making hand annotations, which is what, you know, if you, if you, you ever dealt with like a, an image project, deep learning, machine learning, you have to go in there by hand, right? So this, this image on the right hand corner, uh, red annotations, I've sort of gone in there by hand and it's, it's tedious and it's very painstaking and it's just not very efficient. So large data requires sort of automated techniques. Um, yeah, we can, we can move on. And this is, this is sort of a lot to look at right here, but we'll, we'll sort of go uh, one week at a time. 
but this is really just represents how diverse our data set was, right? Our images were um, the, the diver we had, you know, seven to 11 classes, but there was so much variation within a single class. Week one, we started out uh, at about 20 days after planting. So these plants were a little bit larger, create some really good cutouts. Um, week two was at very early growth stage. I mean, these, these plants were tiny. Um, there's a couple of other things that, that we sort of came up against. I'm looking down here in the very bottom of week two. Sensor uh, had some troubles adjusting to light, right? So, but our annotation system was still able to sort of make up for that. Um, week three, looking up here at the top, this is a horseweed, what we know as horseweed. Uh, there's some portions of plants that were heavily shadowed um, that would just sort of be removed by our annotation system. Um, start going into week four is when the plants started getting larger. Um, and our, you know, plants on this table were also stressed. You know, there was some stress involved, which is pretty normal. And so you have to sort of, we have to sort of think about that in developing this system. Um, because we want that in our data set. That, that's important information to have. That's what you're gonna see in the real world. And what was really interesting is like week five here on the top, um, we had pest damage. So we're working in greenhouse, you have mites, extremely common to see this, right? Um, when you have lots of people coming in and out. So we had mite damage, which causes these tiny little white blemishes, white spots. So if you're using um, you know, vegetation indices or morphological operations, it wow. could be very easily, um, you can remove these white spots and you're left with holes, but we, we didn't want that. A um, Couple of other examples toward the end, grasses were really difficult. Um, they would get really close to the sensor. Um, and that was you know, something that we had to do overcome. Um, and so, you know, we combined some of our classes. And then, um, as you can see, it's, it's a little imbalanced, right? And so if you're training a neural net, working in machine learning, you want a, a balanced data set that that's really going to be the best option for you. So then that was an opportunity for us to use synthetic data. Um, and so this is Soren's work. He was able to take these cutouts that we created, as you see on the left, apply them to a blank soil background, distribute them all across that image and create a highly accurate, uh, annotated, dense scene that could be used for training. Um, and then, as you see sort of in this graph- very cool, by the way. <laughs> yes, this is Soren's work, it's very, very cool. Um, this graph, so, it, so in this way, then we could sort of even out that data set. We can balance out our, our, our data set. Um, and, and so the, this synthetic approach has a lot of benefits. Can we go to the, the next slide? Right, so, so you're now able to balance the data set, as we mentioned, but also you have highly accurate annotations. And that's, like I mentioned, you know, Hannah, that, that's really hard to do in a dense scene. Um, you have also like, you can control the distribution of these plants across an image because plants are biological. There are patterns, you know, some, the way that plants grow in their communities, you, you, you know, you sort of want to replicate that in some sense, uh, or, or it's good to be able to do. Um, you also just broaden so, sort of the, span of synthetic conditions, as we say. It's, you can apply different types of augmentation that can replicate you know, differences in light, right? If you collect images in the you know, early parts of the day, gonna be different than later parts. Um, so you can sort of replicate that. And, and you know, one of the, the biggest benefits here is you're also including occlusion. So this is sort of the, the enemy for computer vision, deep learning, um, occlusion is really difficult to, 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 to account for. Um, right. But you can, you can replicate that also. 
and we can move on. But, you know, so we created a synthetic data set, but our, our real world scenario in this case, in the open CV and in the Benchpot case was what we have here on the right, sort of deployment conditions. And so we, we then sort of were thinking, okay, could we develop a data set that's a little bit closer to deployment conditions? And this serves a couple of different purposes, right? It can, uh, it, it introduces more diversity in our data set and it allows us to test in deployment conditions, right? Um, and so we, we did that. We can move on. So we created sort of following what, what Soren has done, created a synthetic bench data set. So in this top left corner, we have a real image. Um, we have these uh, moving to the right, we have our cutouts that we created. We were also able to do some, you know, some sort of simple uh, photoshopping of our images to create this pot. This is just done by hand, I did this. And then the same with a blank background. Uh, so I created 27 empty pot images and five empty bench images. And so then this here, this lower left-hand corner, we created, this is a, a synthetic image. This is not real. We sort of randomly, semi-randomly um, Matt, placed Matt, these. can I uh, interrupt you just for yeah. a second? Uh, so basically, uh, you know, uh, some people have, because the show ends, you know, uh, most of the people have slotted an hour. Uh, can we just interrupt it just for a second? We will just uh, ask the question so that people, if they have to go, they can go. But the recording of this entire show would be available. Uh, it looks like we'll go over a little bit today. So, but uh, I just want people to be able to participate in that uh, question. Right? Yeah, let's do the, let's do the giveaway. Mind, uh, we can just pause for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. yeah, Satya, would you like to tell them what they'll win? Well, there are two things they all win. First of all, uh, this uh, competition was sponsored by uh, Microsoft, um, Azure, and Intel. So we will get 200 hours of free uh, processing time on Azure Cloud. And we will also uh, uh, throw in uh, OpenCVI kit um, with depth light. And this will be available only after the Kickstarter campaign is over when everybody gets their units. Uh, the person who wins here will get there at the same time. Yeah, so um, the way this works, if you've never been here before for our little trivia competitions, is that I will ask a trivia question I've taken, I've come up with from the slides of the presentation, so it pays to pay attention. The first person to answer the question correctly in my chat window on Zoom will win what Satya just described. Also, please, if you've won recently, don't answer. Uh, if you've won in the last month or so, we've got some repeat winners. Some of you are just too damn good. <laughs> and we wanna make it fair for everybody. Uh, so um, get ready to answer. Before using Oak D, the team used a different brand of camera to capture data. What brand of camera was that? Oh, they got it. They got it quick. On my screen, I see uh, Cobus Mayer uh, with uh, the correct answer of GoPro. So we will uh, be in touch uh, about your prize. Let's get on with the webinar. All right. Sorry for the interruption. Let's let's go on. And people who miss, uh, if they have to go to meetings, etc the recording of this webinar would be available on YouTube and uh, you know, Phil will share the link with everybody. Yes, indeed. Great, yeah, that's uh, good. I'm, I'm glad we can, we can do that. Um, yeah, so I, I was sort of perusing the, the chat and a couple and questions and a couple good questions sort of came up. Um, one was about sort of the background and, and, and why you couldn't just create a very simple background. And, and I think that's what we tried to do here. So from the, this was a second year of this competition for us. In the first year, we used a, a white sort of metal background uh, that had sort of holes. It was like a mesh metal. Um, and that generated a lot of noise for us. 
um, that was really difficult to create these annotations. So uh, someone had the idea this year to, to put a black background. And that was really sort of a game changer for us. I mean, that, that really simplified things. Um, and so that, that's really a main reason um, why we can generate these, these foregrounds and, and just making a simple, uh, uncomplicated environment scene. Um, but sort of back to the synthetic bench images, um, you know, we, we placed the, the pots sort of semi-randomly and place the plants semi-randomly and that, then we can generate a mask. So then we have an additional data set, synth synthetic images and their labels um, that could be then used uh, for training. Okay, we're going to move forward. Then I'm going to pass it on to, to Soren here. Uh, yeah, just I'll... a quick question, isn't this, this must be pretty big, almost revolutionary in your field uh, this amount of synthetic data, I don't know what is the size right now, but just the capacity you have with this, it, uh, is, is it very big news in, the, uh, in, in your uh, domain? I, uh, so I'll, I'll, I have something to admit here. Uh, went to Soren, Soren probably doesn't know this. In my master's, when I started in about 2018, I came across Soren's paper one of his first papers about sort of this synthetic data set. And I think that changed a lot for uh, people in sort of the, the agricultural domain, the remote sensing domain, at least in, in sort of my lab, um, just to be able to see, oh, wow, you, there's like a whole nother level here that, that we can play around with in, in terms of like creativity and overcoming this, this huge obstacle we have of gathering data. I mean, that, that, is really, that is really the problem. It's a data set development problem. You know, how are you collecting it? How are you cleaning it? Creating labels, all to, to train a model. Um, I think this is all still pretty new, pretty novel in, in our domain. And, uh, but it's been, yeah, it's been pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so, so in computer vision, right, you may, you, you're probably obviously aware of uh, the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge. Yeah. And it was started in 2010. And, you know, it was interesting at that time. It was in 2012 when it just exploded, right? The, it just started a revolution, but it started in, it, it, in 2012, two years after the competition began. Earlier, the submissions were interesting. But in 2012, uh, the CNN-based submissions, when they won, it was really big news. So, you know, yeah. some of these things take time, but once you have a very large data set, which was impossible before, people will do wonders, right? When, when, the, when the problem comes to the computer domain, right, in the digital domain, uh, and it's no longer, they don't have to worry about data annotation, they don't have to worry about all these things, the data is given to them, then the, uh, the amount, the number of people who can contribute just goes through the roof. And that's where, you know, uh, you could be at the threshold of a very big thing. And I think, yeah, you know, there's a lot of sort of that trickling down from 2012, right? I mean, there's tons of attention on autonomous driving, yep. on sort of facial recognition, right? I mean, there, that is sort of, um, you know, tons of resources there yeah. but now we see it okay entering these other domains like agriculture ecology conservation um you, you know so everywhere you look it's really there's just so much potential right and uh, uh just one more thing i want to add because this is so exciting uh so fifi lee who uh who was pushing the ImageNet uh data collection effort she is, uh, she's one of the top researchers um, in computer vision. And people were saying that, oh, you're going to ruin your career by working on this data set. Because I don't think she had a tenure at that time that working on this data set, who cares about data sets? All you're doing is collecting a large data set. But, you know, she, she decided to risk her career in some sense. And, uh, you know, the payoff has been huge. Uh, and you guys uh, could be, you know, you, you guys could be bringing that kind of uh, big revolution in your field because of this effort that you're doing. So really big. Could I add just uh, two things to that as well? Um, so one point about, or one problem about agriculture is also that 
if you need more data, you have to wait another year to collect this because the plants only grow once per year. Oh, uh, so if true. you need to, have to add a new condition in the training test. That's a great point. It takes a lot of time, uh, but it doesn't do that in a synthetic case, of course. Right. And building on to, to, uh, to the image set, uh, debate, uh, we do work right now on, on uh, collecting and publishing uh, this very extensive wheat database um, of US wheat um, to sort of support the synthetic image generation. Right now, it, it's underway, it's not uh, finished yet, but this group works on that. If I can add a little thing there, uh, we are working in this. It's for now a three-year project, but it could be longer, hopefully not so much longer, but it's, as Paolo was saying earlier, it's going to be this big, big data set with weeds uh, from uh, different regions in the US. So we have three partners working on that is Maryland, Texas, and North Carolina. And we are, the idea is to collect high resolution images uh, for weeds at different growth stages in uh, like a semi-field condition. In that case, it's gonna be using these bench pots, uh, but also in field conditions. And for that, uh, Soren, uh, Matthew, we're working on, and Paula, we are working on this uh, system with higher resolution cameras uh, that we could use at the field as well. So it's gonna be a big enterprise. We have a lot of people working on it, but I think that the end product, as you were saying, it's gonna be amazing. And once we can put that on people's hands, because it's gonna be open source, um, we are just going to have to wait there and see what happens with that. But it's definitely uh, very exciting. Yeah, and, and if you ask people from outside who are not working in this uh, field and ask them to work on weed detection, I think um, uh, many people will be attracted for the wrong reasons also. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> or the right reasons, Satya. Oh, the right reasons. <laughs> That's right. OK, let's, uh, let's see CNN training. Yep. So if you go forward, one slide. So as we talked about uh, before, um, we have lots of possibilities uh, in agriculture and computer vision. And if we don't have any limitations, we can basically do, we can do almost nothing, or almost everything, sorry. <laughs> so this is an example of a 61 megapixel image um, taken with a professional camera, uh, segmented using a, a very large semantic segmentation model to separate uh, the, the ground from grasses, from, non-grass uh, plants, dicots. And we can do this uh, very accurately, but if we want to do it in the field, in real time, on a cost-effective uh, device, we cannot do this. We have uh, a number of constraints. Um, of course, we have the real-time processing, so we cannot see how the model performs and, and do some tweakings. Um, we have the price justifications if we want to, to deploy it at every farmer. Mm -hmm. We have the com computational and memory constraints, so we cannot really process it at full resolution uh, and, and wait a few minutes for the results. And of course, we cannot give the farmer a $6,000 camera system. Um, so these are some of the constraints we have in this project. And uh, so if you go forward. So most of, of this CNN training does not really involve the uh, well, the deep learning model development per se, but it, it, it sort of tackles uh, how we, we can do this uh, semantic conversation in real time on this device. Um, we chose by experience to work on the, uh, a deep lab V3 model. So it's, it's a standard model. Uh, we chose to have a mobile net V3 backbone. So it, it's sort of aimed at, at uh, embedded processing. So we cannot expect the, the high spatial resolution, but we can expect a high inference throughput. So we did a few experiments. At first, we tried to experiment with the, uh, the backbone size. So we just tried two different uh, model complexities of the mobile net. That's a small and large default model. Uh, we also looked at the, the problem of classifying. If you go forward one slide. So we have 11 classes, if we count all species and, and all the, and, and the soil. We don't care that much about the specific species, but we do care about the category of plant. 
so by reducing the the the, the problems so yeah the problem from 11 classes to four classes really helps us not only increase our accuracy but also increase the complexity of the model and finally there's the uh, the old trade-off between image size and and uh, accuracy so of, of course we we cannot put input the the image in the in the in the original resolution. Um, we have some memory constraints, and we have some some um, throughput where we, that we want to to maintain. So we know that the stereo vision depth is uh, most accurate in the center of the image. So at first we decided to simply cut off the edge of the RGB image because that's not our main focus in this semantic segmentation. Um, finally, we did some experiments uh, just resizing the image to find the, the right trade-off between accuracy and and spatial uh, well spatial accuracy as well as interrupt time. Uh, we end up training our model for cropped uh, images at a 512 by 512 resolution, if that makes sense. And we trained the model to do four class predictions, so background or soil and grasses and clover and broadly plants. So if you go forward, Paul, and here you, just, here you see some examples. So these are real RGB images on the left and yeah, well, on the left side. <laughs> and you see overlaid class predictions on the right. And the, uh, the clover is, is red, the broadleaf is orange, grasses are green, and the background is blue. So I would say that these are quite impressive results, given that it's embedded real-time processing. Yeah. Um, we do have some small mistakes. For example, the along the edges of the leaves, it's not pixel accurate, but that's basically because of the model size and the, the resolution reduction that we have. Yeah, this also, is, we this is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And also, if you look at the upper right corner, you can still see that uh, the, the wooden frame that you have in the bottom of the image is partly painted green. So here you see that the model is not entirely confident in the benchmark settings, but it's a lot better than before that we included synthetic benchmark images, simply because strings and wooden frames are not that common in the field. So we didn't include that that much in the field or in the training images. Yes. And if you go forward. Yes. So as, as I mentioned, we, we uh, trained a small backbone model and a big back backbone model to do the segmentation. And we ended up using the large model. So evaluated on a synthetic data set, we had a mean accuracy of 85%. That doesn't say that much because the, the, the majority of the pixels are so. But for for the clover and broadleaf and grass, we had a, I would say, decent accuracy. And the biggest error is not from actually identifying the plant, but it's from, from the uh, contour of the plant. So especially the clovers and grasses have very narrow leaf, so it's very hard to, to accurately classify that boundary. Okay. And you can go forward, forward and just one small. So finally, when we had this model trained in TensorFlow, we could convert it to intermediate representation and basically make it ready for the uh, deployment. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Soren. So, yeah, so the next step here, so is also try to, to move forward with the um, inference model that we wanted to put inside of the camera. And that also was a little tricky just to find a way that what is the size that we want to, that we can manage with the camera. So, uh, and there was like a loop, just trying, trying some models and try again. So, and we find that we found that was the small model was for perfect and the latency and the, the, the trope was um, two frames per second was good in the cam inside of the camera with this model. In real time, and it was one of the things that we have, like, a, you know, we don't have this flavor for victory last competition, but right now with these two frames per second, we are feeling so good. So we just 
use uh, Intel Dev for the uh, with the Dev Cloud for the Edge with OpenVINO to get this information and implement the model uh, the blob uh, format inside of the uh, of the camera. So the final implementation also included uh, the biomass estimation. So and we have right now we're talking about the annotation and the images, but also we need to include the, the model. In this case, we were using and we were testing different kinds of models, the statistical models and also machine learning models to create the, the estimation. But what kind of characteristics of features we want to create? So we create a vector of features uh, with the vegetative indexes that Matthew was talking about, and also the canopy high measurement that we made uh, during the last competition, the 2020 competition. So we create this feature vector with a excess of green, excess of, excess of red, and leaf area index uh, as the area of the plan, of the label. And the canopy high measurement was the um, histogram analysis over the depth information. So here the depth was pretty important. And we were working directly with the label of the annotation to create the estimation, but also we were working with the label during the segmentic segment uh, with the segmentic segmentation model inside of the inside of the camera, so we have more or less in between 40 and 60 observations per with category, and we were testing different kind of models. So linear model with a statistical as a statistical model and the machine learning regression model with a random forest, and in both cases we got a more than 0 0.8 in the coefficient of determination. It was great. For the for the three classes, for broadleaf grasses and, and clover, with this model we also we also have the capability to integrate this model inside of the virtual inside of the BPU inside of the uh, camera. So the final implementation you can see here we implemented we implemented that inside of the Raspberry Pi with the camera directly. So we just working with the uh, 1080 pixels uh, resolution of the camera. And also we center cropped the image in this size that the model was able to, to work, 512 by 512. In the depth camera, we were working with the disparity map just for visualization, but we create the depth uh, lumpy array to make the analysis with the canopy high measurement. Finding the bonding box per category. So we was there just finding the bonding box and trying to match this bonding box directly with the depth information and create the feature vector to estimate the biomass and also create the visualization of the results and all just running in the, in, in the camera. And that was great. So here you can see uh, the video that, that we have with the, the demo video that we have. If you want to see the complete video, you can take a picture of this QR code. But this is the benchmark inside of the uh, greenhouse and how the benchmark is, is taking pictures and video. This is in real time. And also how we can see here the biomass estimation. So in this case, with the validation, we, we know that right now the accuracy is bigger than 80% uh, for broadleaf and clover. We have some issues with grasses because the grasses, as Matthew uh, did show before, the grasses are were, were touching the camera at some moment. But for broadleaf and, and clover, it's a real good tool. So, and right now we have this like a reality thing that this is a real time data to make decisions in the field. So this is this is one of the uh, uh, of the things that, that that we wanted to 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 mention today. But also, I think that with this webinar, also we want to inspire the people that is working in computer vision community. So and and we need to know better about the challenges for the future. What kind of challenges we have as a community, as a computer vision community? What is the what is the role that the computer vision community has in the agriculture? So, and I think that the the main thing that we need to know uh, who is the end user of the technology, and what is the capability of that user to get the technology. We need to create accessibility of the, of the to the technology directly. We need to create low cost sensors. Uh, easy to use systems, easy to maintenance, working for different kinds of conditions. You can create a very good algorithm working for a perfect conditions, but when you move forward to the outer conditions, it's, it's not working. So, and also 
this is a great point that we have a lot of discussions in the webinar, open source community. We need to have availability of real data. So, and this is something that we have as a goal. And, and also availability of software and hardware designs, because if we want to have, if we have real data and we have the, the capability to see these designs and replicate the things, we can increase a lot and we can um, accelerate the, the, the production of this kind of computer vision system. Also think about the cross-platform tools for non-tech people. So I, I love the idea of RoboCloud, for example. So when you, if you don't have computer vision background, you can go there and try it by yourself. And That's OpenCV Silver Partner RoboFlow. <laughs> that is great. So sorry. So, um, and also one thing that is great is also think about that we need to decentralize deployment for true scalability. And this is one of the things that Luxonics is doing. So it's, it's that we are in the right moment, in the right place. So we can move forward as a community. That is the message. And thank you so much. And thank you for the people that is, is here until this hour. So, and thank you, Satya and Bill. Do you have questions? You're uh, muted, Satya. <clears throat> Do you want to uh, briefly talk about, thank you so much first. Um, can you briefly talk about the competition that you guys are organizing, the hackathon? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, see, I mean, we have um, this hackathon will be will be done October 8th, 9th and 11th in the university and SSU, North Carolina State University. So you can take a picture of this QR code and see the flyer and also the registration information. So this is uh, this hackathon uh, is sponsored by OpenCV, Luxonics, Microsoft, SAS and RoboFlow. We have three different targets. So one target is in per, it's just in person that is a hardware target. Um, we want to use the bench bot in this target. And also we have uh, two another targets. One is for so with software, just uh, that you can work with the uh, Danish uh, data set to train your skills in deep learning approaches. And also we have the third approach, uh, the third target, sorry, that is uh, more related, like a, it's not a target specifically, it's more like a, a educational workshop to work with RoboFlow. So in that target, we are looking for pe non-tech people. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about biologists, agronomists, uh, that they, can, they want to use the computer vision stuff and they can learn. Mm -hmm. And this is a great opportunity if you're interested. So take a look, take a picture of this QR code and please register. That's great. Thank you, Satya. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now we can take questions. I just wanted to make sure that people get this information. Yes, uh, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, yeah, Paulo, Maria, Matthew, Sorensen, great presentation, a little bit longer than normal, but I think it was worth it. Um, we've got a couple, we can do a couple of questions here. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull up the screen here. Uh, one of the earlier ones, wanted to know has your team looked at quality controls in pack houses at all say again somebody wanted to know has your team looked at quality control in packing houses uh as like an extension of this work at all no we're we're mostly sort of focused on outdoor you, you know weed detection for uh application purposes yeah Bye. gotcha um Somebody asked if we will, if you'll share the uh, slideshow as well. Would you mind when, when we upload it to YouTube? I'll go ahead and drop the link if you all don't mind. Yes, for sure. We don't mind. That great. great. We are in an open source community. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, somebody wanted to know about wavelengths. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the the wavelengths that you care about for you know the visual light or near infrared. Do you use any color filters, etc.? So for this project, we just are using RGB information because it's the, the best the best way to understand the morphology of the plant. But also we have an, another project that we are working with a multispectral cameras or multispectral sensors. But for this specific project, we were using just RGB and depth. Great. Um, you, you want to talk a little bit more about, I'm interested in this other project now with uh, other sensors. You want to give us a brief, can you talk about it? So, um, 
So that is a, that is a, another project that we have also to measure biomass, and so it, it's it's a sensor that is possible just to use um, a multispectral information in in red age and infrared and ultrasonic just to try to measure the biomass. But that's expensive sensor, so this is this is something that is not able to replicate in a simple way. Uh, and it's also uh, you can mount the sensor on the tractor, or also you can walk. To the field and take the, the information there and you you are able to see images it's just information coming like a like a signal uh, for different sensors and you can process like a, a signal processing normal signal processing but that is the i mean a big picture of the project cool yeah um I, a question for me is i like to ask this whenever we have people from the competition on the show is what was the most surprising thing to you about working on this over the course of the competition? Okay, so I think that the most, I mean, the most impacting that I can see, I could see was the support that we have from Luxonics. So we have a lot of issues, we had a lot of bugs, but they answered so was so fast and, 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 and they also think about that we have as end users and non-tech users, so we 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 got the support and the proper answer. So and we have a lot of calls and and meetings and I send the scripts and they send the, the scripts back. So and it was difficult just to uh, figure it out, but at the end it was working pretty good. And this, I mean, for me, as you know, I was working more in the hardware part, just preparing preparing the camera and running the scripts and the embedded system. That was the thing that was most impacting for me. I don't know for the rest of the team, sorry, Matthew or Maria Laura. Yeah, if anybody else wants to, you know, answer what sort of surprised them the most too, we can uh, do that and then maybe call it a call it a show afterwards. Phil, could you also add uh, Laksana's Discord channel for people who might have? Bought? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So if you have bought an Oak uh, or Oak D or Oak D Light. Uh, Luxana's Discord channel is the technical where all the technical discussions, questions happen. So mm -hmm. please uh, uh, join that. Uh, yeah, it's pretty lively over there too. I, I would highly recommend, even if you don't currently have any issues, it's good to just you know hop in and see what's going on because you even get the inside scoop on new hardware uh, by hanging out in there as well. I'd say that maybe, you know, the biggest thing that surprised or not necessarily surprised me, but was most impactful is just sort of working in the team that we're working with, you know, across different uh, parts of the, the world, but also across disciplines. I think um, there's like so much nuance in this problem and like, you know, the weed detection problem that I think like pure, you know, pure discipline approach just I think it, it loses that nuance. And so you sort of have to have all these different people, sort of like different perspectives, um, you know, thinking about the same thing and thinking about it differently. Um, and I'd sort of never really been uh, part of it and part of something like that in terms of sort of remote. Um, but it was, that, that was pretty cool to, to see and, you know, working on code and, you know, sharing uh, you know, doing commits and, and all that fun stuff that that was that was pretty fun and, and new to me as someone with mostly like a agricultural background. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Maria, would you like to uh, weigh in on what was surprising to you? Yeah, and I mean, my, my thing, I think, is kind of close to what Matthew was talking about. I was thinking about that, but also a lot of the products that we work on, not just the one that we were working for in this competition, include the, the end user too. So we do a lot of what has to do with like making this easy to use for people. And that for me, that is the most rewarding and I think um, exciting thing is to think how all this complexity and things that seem so hard to understand or work with at the end end up being this easy to use thing that makes makes this so accessible and I I'm, I think that when you get to that point this that's when you are like wow <laughs> I mean this is amazing that's when when I get that wow factor because um 
yeah, we, I think that I, I don't know who was talking about AI democratization. I think it was in one of these webinars or something. And I think that that is amazing. Like the day that we can get there and uh, make AI and technology help the world in different ways, um, uh, that, that's what's amazing for me. And I think that in this competition, we were doing a lot of that. Uh, so that's great. Awesome. Th thanks for that. It's probably Cortic Tigers, our grand prize winners that were discussing that. Um, Soren, would you like to talk about what surprised you? So it's, it's uh, similar to what Matthew was saying as well. Uh, so I'm saying it's surprising that we got this far uh, without ever meeting. Um, so <laughs> Great answer. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, Paula, would you mind uh, turning off the screen share here so we can do our little outro? Um, uh, Soren, you have more to say? Sorry. So, so we, we did meet at least most of us way before the competition, but we haven't met since 2019. At least I haven't. Um, so, I, and I haven't had the, the device in hand or seen the plans. So it, it's surprising that we could make it work so, so well, I would say. There's, yeah, the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Yep. Um, Satya, you want to take us home? Well, one uh, for all the people who have waited uh, for this this long session, I just wanted to give one surprise, you know, there are not, so I, I, I'm unable to reveal many things, but let me just give you one surprise. People have been asking whether OpenCV uh, AI kit with depth OD can be used as a webcam. And uh, this one is actually, um, you know, th this webcam that you're looking at right now, this is from uh, an OD, right? I cannot, uh, you know, right now we are not in a position to release the software or anything like that. But I wanted to convey that it is certainly possible uh, right now. This this particular view is from that uh, camera. And it's just doing some background blurring and everything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's depth based background blurring. So when when we release this thing, you know, you probably would be able to do uh, much more. But uh, this is all information that is you know not guaranteed. You know, we may not release that software and things like that. So. With, but it is certainly possible for people to build a webcam using their uh, OBD camera. So, and it's a very affordable 4K webcam oh, uh, yeah. compared to, say, a Logitech Rio, which is like $200. Right, right. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, and congratulations again on winning uh, the competition. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being here. Uh, really enjoyed this talk. I learned a lot uh, myself. And so amazing, amazing work. Um, and Phil, thank you for, uh, for being, uh, you know, managing this thing. And thank you, everybody, all the audience members for sticking with us. It, this was a longer show, but I'm sure that it was worth your while. Uh, and we'll, we'll come again next week. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Next week, our guest will be John Keefe, co-founder and director of Draw and Code, creators of Swap Bots and a bunch of other really cool uh, in real life computer vision stuff. So we look forward to that. All right. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by Microsoft Azure and Intel, sponsors of the world's largest spatial AI competition, OpenCV AI Competition 2021. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter 